Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. We've been preaching through the book of Genesis, as most of you know. Of course, you wouldn't know that if you weren't visiting, unless maybe you tracked us on YouTube or on our channel. But we're preaching. We've come to chapter 43 and uh, preaching through uh, Genesis in a series called Origins, the Study of Genesis. I'm preaching you this morning the message entitled, Returning Kindness for Hurt. Returning Kindness for Hurt. I'm not going to ask you now, but I wonder how many people in this assembly this morning as we come together hold, carry, have significant hurts in your heart that others have put there by the way that they've treated you in the past or or the way that they intentionally treated you, or maybe didn't intentionally treat you, but yet you have hurts that you are carrying this morning. This message is, is for you. The story of Joseph and his brothers really just dominates the end of Genesis. I had written here in, in uh, the first paragraph that I believe that, Genesis, or that Joseph has more page time than any other person in Genesis. But I didn't have time to go back and, and recount page numbers. But I believe that the, that the Lord talks about him more than anyone else. And if that's true, I mean, the whole end of the chapter or the end of, of the book is dominated by the story of Joseph. And if that is true, that God is so concerned with him, we should ask why. We should understand that this is not just a really neat story and it has some bizarre twists and turns or whatever. We should realize that God is working on us through this story of Joseph and that there are things that the Lord is addressing in, in our hearts, things that we need to be Jesus followers. Each part of the story has to do with God's love for hurting children, his justice, his chastening, and how he can redeem even the, the, the vilest or the most destructive of people. And that's, of course, Joseph's brothers. And bring them into the use of his own purposes. This is what we're, we're learning from the story of Joseph. It's very important to God, and so it should be very important to us. Joseph's story is unfolding. We've been preaching it, and it is unfolding. Uh, I had lunch this past week with a guy uh, that's probably here today, and he's, he's, we we're talking about Sunday morning, and I mentioned about Joseph, and he's like, Joseph again? Yeah, yeah, just like Joseph again until we finish Genesis, Joseph again. So don't look for the ending, just enjoy the middle, right? So Joseph's story is unfolding through the weeks as we preach it. He was the victim of his brothers uh, being uh, used uh, he's a victim, and he's being used as the judge for his brothers, bringing them into the knowledge of what God wants to use them for, the repentance, and bring. he's the teacher. He's the victim and the judge and the teacher. In chapter 42, uh, I pointed out his brother's comeuppance. And we use this, uh, this phrase, Joseph's ruse. Remember that? That he had this trick, that this kind of trickery thing that was going on, that he was doing all these what seems bizarre in the first reading, things to his brother, but it all had purposes. In fact, the more you slow down and, and ask yourself, well, why did Joseph do that to his brothers? And why do you do this and this and this? And we'll see a few more uh, next week. You find out that all of them had connections to what God was teaching his brothers. These situations of calling them spies, of putting them into prison for three days, of detaining Simeon, they're all working. All these things are working on these boys' hearts on these men's hearts, these brothers' conviction, softening them, changing them. Uh, they are being uh, convicted by God to change. Joseph's treatment of his brother is really God's lesson after lesson after lesson of inflicting experience and pain and fear and conviction and guilt within these brothers. And, and you can really see that as the story unfolds all along. We're going to see that much more in chapter 44. It's really fascinating to see God's long-term game of bringing people to repentance. And, and let me just mention this. It's very merciful for God to bring any one of us to repentance. It's very merciful for God to chasten us. It's very merciful for God to confront us and show us things that aren't right in our life. He could just leave us alone. And that would be the worst thing that he could do. But he lovingly and mercifully uh, confronts us. But there is something else going. I better get there in Genesis 43 that we are going to address today other than his brother, these brothers being changed. Something else is going on in Joseph's heart. It is love, it is mercy, and it is the compassion of Joseph returning kindness 
for the hurt that he received from these brothers. And don't, don't just take this for granted. Any one of us in Joseph's situation, wouldn't have you wanted to get back at these brothers? Wouldn't you have wanted to, like, they sold him, they were going to kill him, they sold him into slavery. Wouldn't you want to just get back at them? But what we see is something that God is doing in Joseph's heart. And so let's read Genesis 43 together. I'm going to let you be seated. It's the whole chapter, so, so let's read it. And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn, remember that word is grain, which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Jodas, Joseph, or excuse me, and Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. I like them calling Joseph the man, the man. Verse 4. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, You shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt you so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had, ye had a brother? Look up here. So basically what dad is saying, you know, what Jacob is saying is, Why would you even tell him you had a brother? You know, why, you, you're, you're, you're getting me in trouble, you know, you're getting this, this big situation. Why don't you just lie? I don't know if he was inferring that they lie or just not give so much information out. Verse 7. And they said, the man asked us straightly of our, our, our state and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel, his father. Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, and uh, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. He means you know, that we won't starve to death. I will be surety for him. Uh, of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, uh, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now... We had returned the second time. He's, he's basically saying, you know, if we wouldn't have fooled around, we could have been there twice getting grain. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so, now do this. Take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down uh, the man a present, a gift, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hand and the money that was brought was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure, it was an oversight. Maybe it was an oversight that they put your money back in your bag. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man. So it's El Shaddai is that name of God there. El Shaddai give you mercy before the man, and he, uh, that he may send away your other brother and, and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children... I am bereaved. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up, and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, this is his steward, we've seen him all along in past chapters, bring these men home, and slay, and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did <coughs> as Joseph bade, and the man brought uh, the men into Joseph's house, and the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time are we brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen, that is slaves, and, and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house and they communed with him at the door of the house and said, oh, sir, we came indeed down at first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the end that we opened our sacks and behold every man's money was in the mouth of his sacks our money in full weight and we have brought it again in our hand and other money have we brought in our hands to buy food we cannot tell who put our money in our sacks and he said listen 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 how he replies to these guys obviously joseph told him to say this peace be un peace be to you fear not for god elohim and the elohim of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man, uh, the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, washed their feet, and gave their asses provender. 
And they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him uh, to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare and said, okay, look up here in a moment. I, I know I, we're reading a long chapter. Remember the last time he, called, he, he had accused them of being spies. There's a massive change in the way he's treating them. He asked them of their welfare. Hey, how you guys been? It's a lot different. And said, is your father well? The old man of whom you spake, is, is he yet alive? And they said, thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance, second time just in this chapter. And he lifted up their eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? He said, God, be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his vows did yearn upon his brother. I mean, you know, he was getting emotional. His heart was breaking. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber's bedroom and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread, or let's start at the feast. And they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves because the Egyptians might not eat bread with Hebrews for that was an abomination unto Egyptians. And they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth and the men marveled one of another. So they're all in a line, you know, oldest to youngest. And he took and sent messes, that's portions of food, uh, unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank, and they were merry with him. And I think the him is Benjamin that they were merry with. Well, this is another part of the story. It advances. The plot goes on. We really don't know how long it had been since the brothers returned to their father, Jacob, with the grain. We don't know. You remember he said, there's no way on earth that you're going back. You know, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to give up Benjamin. You know, we're never going there again. They return with grain, but without their brother, Simeon, who Joseph had put in bonds. He'd been held, held captive back in Egypt. You remember Jacob had vowed he would never let Benjamin return to Egypt as the, that man, the Egyptian man, had demanded. Joseph, of course. However, it couldn't have been very long before the grain ran out. And I say that with some knowledge because we're in chapter 43 and two chapters only. It is mentioned uh, over it in 45, it is mentioned that it's only the second year of the famine. So if they would have came even at the beginning of the famine, it could only have been really a couple of months or something. They eat up all their grain, maybe six months, eight months, who knows. But now they're back. And uh, Jacob's fear has diminished, his anger has subsided, and he sends them back. In verse number five, they say, we can't go back to the man unless we have Benjamin. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, and Israel said, wherefore dealt you so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother. Look at the second word there in the verse. What does the Bible call Jacob? Israel, right, you can yell it out, Israel. We haven't seen him called Israel in a while. It's been Jacob. You remember Israel was his new name because he got it when he wrestled the pre-incarnate Jesus and he held on until daylight. And, and, G, and Jesus, the Godhead, was, was so impressed with uh, Jacob, desiring a blessing from the Lord, his incredible faith, and, and he gave him a new name. And he calls him Israel, not Jacob anymore, which means prince with God and one who prevailed with God and men. So he gives them this name of prince. Well, let me ask you just a question. You've been with me, most of you, for the last couple chapters. Is he acting princely? It's been chapters since he's shown any faith and he's acted princely at all. He's acting more like a guy who didn't know the Lord. He has been in fear. He hasn't been living in faith. He doesn't, he hasn't, there's no faith at anywhere shining that he believed that God had any plan in all of this, but rather he's been pouting in faithlessness and in fear. Ding, ding, ding. This sounds a little bit like Toby sometimes. Not me, some other guy in our church named Toby. But here in verse 14, he basically resigns himself to hopelessness when he says, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Well, the Bible gives us some hope in several times in this passage calling him Israel. 
It's like God is saying, hold on, guys, you guys who are going to be learning this thousands of years later after it happened. Hold on, I'm going to give you a little hope that, that my servant, Jacob, is going to act like a prince again. That there is going to be resolution to this hurtful story. He is my prince. He is prevailed with God and man. He's down, hey, but he's not out. Jacob is a patriarch of the Jews. He's one of the three foundations upon which God would build his people. He was a man of great faith. He needs to rise up in faith again and believe that God is the one who has control. Even those things seem awful dumpy. Do things ever get dumpy in your life? You're acting more like Jacob than you are like a prince? A prince of God? Can I just say there are many times when we wallow in our faithlessness as well and we need to rise up And remember that we are not known in our identity by our old names. I mean that spiritually. That God has given us a new name when he saved us by Jesus Christ. He has called us saints of God. He has called us justified. He has called us children of the living God. So, you know, what? can you tell your thoughts that? Jacob, that you're really Israel? Could you... Tell yourself when you are in darkness and there seems to be no faith in your heart at all, can you remind yourself that you have been made a saint of God, a child of God, and that God has committed himself to you? We need to rise up in faith also. There are many times like this. Quote me, please, as dark as your life may get, there is never hopelessness to the child of God. As dark as your life may get. And there's a reason for that. In this passage, Israel, Jacob, had been given the same covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, that his daddy and his granddad were given, and God had committed himself to him. We have so much more a surer covenant, the new covenant. When we signed on with Jesus Christ, when we died to ourselves and took Jesus as our Savior, he gave us a covenant, the new covenant. He came to live inside of us. He wrote, wrote our name eternally in the book of life. He forever committed himself to us and said that nothing can separate us from his love. We have so much more a surer covenant, and we have been given new names as well. Well, Judah pledges himself to his father. You see, one of the sons speaks up Judah. He pledges himself to his father Israel, much like Reuben did in the last chapter that we preached. He says, if Benjamin doesn't come back, you can blame me forever. Okay? Remember, Reuben had said something even worse than that. He had said to his dad, if Benjamin doesn't come back with me, you can slay my two sons. I think we're seeing something here. I think there's a little bit of, you know, hot air coming out the mouth of both of these guys. But but you can see something that really is interesting for, for nearly the first, kind of the first time. You can see that they are caring about someone other than themselves. These murderous, selfish abusers are caring about whether their brother comes home, are caring about their father's heart. They are actually starting to be sacrificial you can blame me forever you can take my two sons they are god is changing them through this whole drama the way that he changes you well they decide in verse number 11 and 12 that they should uh they should bring the egyptian man a present a gift this was daddy's idea okay a gift and and the bible goes by the way do you know that there's no fluff in god's word okay listen if he tells you If he tells you that they took Joseph pistachios, which he does, there's a reason for it. There's no fluff in God's words. It is the inspired word of God. It is out of of the heart of God. Amen? Yes? The Holy Spirit. Okay, he he goes to the trouble of writing down what they take him as a present because it's going to mean something later in the story. It it says that they're going to take him a a few things. They're going to take him balm, which is a salve kind of thing, I think, whatever. Honey, which is a grape honey that was made in the promised land. Spices, myrrh, nuts. And by the way, this word nuts is likely pistachios. I like me some pistachios. Would you mind shelling them for me so I could enjoy them more? And almonds. Amy likes almonds. I don't like them. They're, they dry up my tongue. I mean, like, why do you eat them? I don't know. Maybe you could slice and put them in ice cream. So these are the things. These are great presents, and they would have been very expensive commodities. It was a famine. Okay, do you realize how much it would have cost to take this gift? All right, this was a famine, a, a very bad famine time. 
It, oddly, there's more to the meaning. Oddly, back in chapter 37, these were named. Now, you've got to think back about when Joseph was first sold into slavery. These things are named as the commodities that the Midianites who bought Joseph were carrying back to Egypt. Now God doesn't make it. He's making some connections. God doesn't. He, he's moving some minds, some thoughts, some, some things, working on these boys. But more noteworthy than all of that is most of these items, and this is going to be obvious, but it's going to be important when Joseph gets the present. Most of these items were foreign to Egypt. You could not get them in Egypt. They had to be brought in. That's why the Midianites brought them in. That's probably why Father Israel takes them as a present because this isn't something that Joseph would normally have. These were things that were grown in the promised land, produced in the promised land, in Canaan only. Israel told them to take double the money back to Egypt because they, they had found their money in their sacks. One commentator brought up a great point about this. So they're taking 20 Double the money. That would have been 20 sacks of money. The word money in verse number 12 is the exact word for silver that they had sold Joseph for. Silver and money, the exact same word. So they sold him for 20 pieces of silver, and now are they re they're returning back to Egypt with 20 sacks of silver. I wonder if any of the brothers made that ironic connection. It would have brought them more guilt, more understanding. Like, holy mackerel, do you realize that we're taking back 20 sacks of silver, and we sold our brother for 20 pieces of silver. I doubt this is a coincidence with God. None of the stuff in the story are coincidences. All the stuff has meaning. In verse number 14, Israel invokes the mercy of God on the whole situation before he sends the boys. He says, God Almighty, El Shaddai, which was God's name of the Abrahamic covenant, the Abraham and God, he revealed himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, God Almighty, is making a covenant. He, he invokes it, J Jacob invokes that the merciful, almighty God will have mercy on these boys before the man and this whole situation will turn out okay. Let that sink in just a little bit, please. He does not know who the man he's praying about is. He does not realize that his prayer has already been answered and is being answered. He's really praying that God would have put mercy in Joseph's heart, in Joseph's heart. He kind of was praying that just in a level that he didn't understand the whole story omnisciently like we do. He's thinking that he's a pretty tough Egyptian guy who has a lot of power there in Egypt. He didn't realize how hard, what he was asking for was, wasn't just a hard thing, it was a miracle thing. Because he's asking that El Shaddai, Almighty God, will give mercy into the heart of a, of a man who those exact boys sold, almost wanted to kill, tried to kill, put him in a pit, sold him out of the pit into slavery, he was drugged to Egypt, in prison, falsely accused and all that. He doesn't know what kind of miracle he's asking for. And let me just say this, listen, when God puts in our heart, any one of us, who have been hurt by people, when he puts in our heart, he fills it full of mercy and forgiveness and love towards those people, it is a miracle. But I want to remind you, that it's El Shaddai who's doing it. And, and he don't have any problem with miracles. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that God wants to put the same mercy in your heart towards those who hurt you that he put in Joseph's heart toward his brethren? I think without a doubt, the answer is certainly yes. That is his will. You remember that Jesus told the Pharisees more than one time that God delights in mercy, in mercy. Mercy is a word that God loves. Mercy is, a, is an attribute of God. He, he is the almighty God who wants to put that in your, you don't know what they did to me, pastor. God does. I kind of doubt it's as much as what people have done to God. Miracle working God, El Shaddai, can put mercy in your heart. In verse number 15, they return to Egypt and they stand before Joseph. And you can scan with me as I tell you the story. He quickly sees that Benjamin is with them. And, and with that joy, he's like, oh, there's Benjamin. And with that joy, he tells the steward of his house to prepare a, a lunch for them, a noon meal. I, I've thought a lot about this steward. It, it's really not part of the sermon at all. But this is the guy who's working the ruse out. 
everything. He's a guy, he's, you know, he is Joseph's right-hand man. And I, I'm thinking about this guy. I'm thinking about whether he's like, what is, what is my master doing? Is he crazy? What do you mean? I'm going to do this now and I'm going to do this now? I mean, it was crazy stuff. You know, put, put the money back in the sacks of their, their grain. What? You know, he, he, does he know what's going on? Does, I don't know. I thought, is he in on it? Does, he, and does Joseph explain all this? Does he know that these guys are Joseph's brothers and he's in on it, kind of in on it? Hey, uh, you know, I need you to come to, to lunch at, at, at the master's house. He, he, he. You know, does he know about it? I don't know. Verse number 18 says the brothers are afraid. Oh, great. He's going to take us, make us slaves in his house. They're still under the fear that they were going to be punished for the money that had shown up in their sacks. So they, so they get this idea that they're going to, and by the way, this is a pretty good idea. If you know you're going to get in trouble, you like confess it. I mean, if you know you're going to big trouble, you like confess it ahead of time so you kind of look good. I see some people are writing down that, confess it ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, so he, they come completely clean uh, to the steward at the door of Joseph's house. They tell him the whole story and confess that they have their money. You know, before he even says anything, or anyone says anything, they come clean. Can you see, these are not the same boys that heckled Joseph as a boy. These are not the same boy that, boys that threw him in the pit. These, something is going on in these guys. They are, they are actually, we could actually use the word honest here. We could actually use the word transparent here. They are telling the person who has the power to enslave them and take their donkeys, they are telling him, we have our own money. We went back with all our own money. God is working in these brothers. And then read verse number 23 as we move through the story. Verse number 23 says, says, and he said, the steward says back to him, peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father, it's not talking about two different gods, it's, you know, it's the same one. Your God, Elohim, the Elohim of your father, hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. What? Wait, what? Wait, what? What is going on here? The Egyptian steward is telling them that their Hebrew God, they're in Egypt, all right? And I told you about, there is such a, uh, a plurality of gods there, but one of them is not Elohim. You know, they're, they're, they're worshiping bizarre things, demon-infused things. You know, they're at, you, know, you can Google it, all right? It's just crazy stuff, gods of the sun, and gods, all this weird stuff. And he's saying that, that, that Elohim, and he, and he connects it to their dad, Okay, he connects it to, the, or their forefathers, that the, the Elohim of Israel, of your forefathers, had miraculously put money back in your sacks, and I've got your payment already? In, in a way, that was true and not a lie. But it was true through the mercy of Joseph, of course. I think it's clear at this point, I'm just going to say, I think this guy's in on it. He's in on it all. In fact, because of the boldness of, of the steward talking about, about Elohim, a God who he, he did not know at all, I, the commentator said that it is possible that Joseph had brought this man to faith in Jehovah. He has certainly said, hey, you know who took care of that for you? You know who's working in your life? Elohim, the God of Israel. It's kind of crazy. We do not know but we do know that these brothers are beginning to feel something. They're beginning to feel the exact opposite of that they felt at the beginning, you know, when he accused them of being spies. They're beginning to feel the kindness of Joseph's mercy on them. They are given water, and their feet are washed, like important people, like people who would be respected. Their animals are fed. More kindness from Joseph. While they wait on Joseph to come home, they get their gift together in verse number 25 to present to him. They're still unsure of what is going on, and their hope is that this gift will, will provoke mercy from the man, the man. Well, God was already doing that mercy. He was already working that miracle of mercy, and, it, and they didn't have to have the gift. Read verse 26 through 28. The scripture says, And when Joseph came home, and uh, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. By the way, all this bowing is just, uh, as you guys know, it was just the fulfillment of his dreams as a boy of what would happen, the God dreams, divine dreams. 
And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom he spake, is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. Bowing, 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 just like his dreams. It all had come true. But now notice there is more kindness. Joseph asks them in verse 27 of their welfare. How are you doing? The last thing they heard him say, you're a bunch of spies. You better prove, bring your other brother back and prove that you're not a bunch of spies. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take you captive or kill you. That's the last that they had heard. But Joseph's whole attitude towards them is changing. More kindness. How are, how are, you, all, how are you guys all doing? How, how, how are you? You know, how are you, your trip okay coming here? Is that, is that okay? How, how's your father been? He asks them. How are, how are you doing? How's your dad? How's your family? He cares for them. We don't see bitterness coming out. We don't see his demand that for restitution coming out. We just see love, and we just see compassion. He asked about their dad, about Israel. Joseph had done this all along. He was very concerned about their dad, his dad, and you knew how close he was to his dad. It shows the hurt in his heart. He wants to know if that dad who loved him so much was doing well. And then he lifts his eyes beyond the nine standing before him, and there is Benjamin. He only gets out a few lines before he breaks in emotion. Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? God be gracious unto thee, my son. You can almost hear his love in his words, in his heart. Well, you can see his tears beginning to well up in his eyes. Scripture says he couldn't take it anymore. He was overwhelmed with emotion. It's, he's in his own house, and he's running in his own house. Imagine you doing it in yours. He's running to find a place where no one can see him, you know, that he can cry. And he ends up in his bedchamber. He ends up in his, in his bedroom, and he, and he just weeps and weeps and weeps. He's overwhelmed. Folks, this is years of both hurt of what had happened in the past, and Benjamin is connected to, and, and, and hopeful joy of now that, Things are going to change, just flowing out of Joseph. And some of you have cried huge bucket loads of tears of the hurt that you have felt in the past of things and people that have hurt you. The Bible says he washes himself and he returns to start the feast. And by Egyptian custom, the Egyptians could not sit at the same table, I assume of foreigners, not just of Hebrews. But they could not, you know, custom was it was an abomination. So there's actually three separate tables in the passage, uh, one for Prince Joseph, one for his other Egyptian guests, and one for the 11 brothers, now being joined by Simeon, who has been held captive to this point. You have to wonder if Joseph was, was throwing a little tip about his identity in what comes ne next, because he had informed the steward to seat them in an interesting way. He, had, he, he was told to seat them uh, from the oldest to the youngest. And by the way, have you ever thought about the probability of that happen randomly? Okay, these are the things that I think through the week. What is the probability of that happening? And I actually emailed with, it was in the commentary, but I didn't believe the commentary, so I emailed with a, uh, a statistician who teaches statistics at the University of Delaware who's been attending our church who's not here this Sunday. Or I call him out, a guy named Brian. And I say, hey, what is, what is, what is the probability that, that someone would just seat these guys, you know, in the exact order, although they didn't know their ages, whatever? Here's the probability. One chance in 39,916,800. Let me say that again, because I didn't say it right. One chance in 39,916,800. Almost one in 40 million that this could happen. That he, you know, do you think the brothers should have thought, huh, Maybe somebody knows us around here. Obviously. Joseph did one more thing to liven up the party. He sends portions from his table uh, to their table. I guess better food. I don't know why. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it was just the regular food that started on his table. I don't know. But to Benjamin, he sends a portion that is five times as large as all the other brothers. Why? As I said, all of these things, all of these things are done for a reason in this story. And I would encourage you to go back and to think about why some of these things are done. It was likely a lesson, a test for the brothers. Would they be jealous of Benjamin's portion as they had been so jealous of Joseph's coat of many colors? 
as they had been so jealous of his father's favoritism towards him, he wanted to see, are these guys the same as they were before? Are they jealous? Are they going to pick one of the, little boy, the, the youngest one? He was not very young at that point. Are they going to pick one of him when he gets more? But the Bible intentionally says in the last couple of verses of our chapter that they, did, that they, did, they made merry. They were happy and joyful with him. And I think it means with Benjamin, who had five times the portion as they had, God was cho- truly changing these boys. Now, now, what is the big idea that we need to take home as we walk out the glass doors today? What does God want to talk to you about from this chapter? We, yes, there, we're going to see more about the change in the boys, and there is a definite progression of how God changes all of us and from, from what we used to be into what we are going to be for his glory. It starts with coming to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. You know, there's this cool thing called sanctification in the Bible where God is progressing us and changing us through trials and through all kinds of pain and through confrontations and through things and through failures and whatever. He is making us like Jesus Christ. So all of this is going, and that's a good message. We're going to see that more in next chapter. But I think the big idea of this chapter is something a little different that we need to get, and here it is. We need to understand the great mercy that Joseph had in his heart that he shouldn't have had when he returned kindness for hurt. I think we need to understand this is more than a Bible story. This is something miraculous that had happened in his heart. Let's point this out and apply it. Hurt. Of course, we know the hurt. I've said it a couple times this morning of Joseph being abused. We preached on this before in the chapters preceding. Abused, mocked, sold into slavery, threatened with death. But Joseph's deeper hurt is being pointed out in this chapter. The deeper hurt of the loss of the relationship with Benjamin. We see him reacting emotionally as as he sees Benjamin for the first time in humpteen years. Did you notice how verse 29 adds something that's not fluff? (laughs) Again, it says when he saw, he saw brother Benjamin, and it says his mother's son. His mother's son, and then he breaks down in emotion and weeps. And and there's a reason that God is calling that. He he wants to remind us that this this was a dysfunctional family with several you know, mothers living in the same camp and all of that. And unlike all the other brothers, unlike all the other brothers, Joseph and Benjamin have a connection that is stronger than all the others. Uh, Joseph and Benjamin were the sons of Rachel, Jacob's first true love. There are two theories about how old Joseph and Benjamin are, their ages as related to each other. But I believe Benjamin was about 10 years old when Joseph was sold into slavery at 17. So you can imagine here these two boys that, uh, you know, Rachel was favored. She was Jacob's first love. Joseph was favored, all right? And you can imagine this 10-year-old and this 17-year-old. You know, the 10-year-old is the only one the scripture says doesn't, doesn't mock him. He's not part of this other group. He's not the one that cast him in the pit or whatever. He is, the, he is his brother by, uh, you know, the common mother. They would have naturally been close because of their common mom and being the youngest boys, the two youngest boys. You can feel Joseph's love for Benjamin clear back in chapter 42. He cannot contain his weeping here when he addresses Benjamin. Words of tender-hearted love for for a brother that he's dearly missed. He calls him this affectionate word, son. God be gracious to you, my son. You You can feel the love coming out. This brotherhood, folks, was stripped from Joseph. It might have been the one joyful thing in his life, because even the favoritism of his father was mocked. It might have been the one happy point in his life that he had a little brother, maybe looked up to him, that didn't mock him that didn't laugh at his dreams. I don't know. But I can tell you what, you can see the love flowing down his face. And it's directly connected with Benjamin. You can see what what the hurt of what was stripped from him by these boys, these brothers, the other brothers. And what he had lost for all these years, he sees again. The loss of his homeland. Rehearsing the hurt that is going on in Joseph and God doing this miracle of mercy 
the loss of his homeland, when the gift, remember the gift? Remember God says what, what the gift was in the gift? Why does he do that? When the gift was presented to Joseph, it was made up of the very things that had come from his homeland. The, the promised land, his, his land, his home. Do you, do you know what it's like to be gone from your family home for a long time? And you go back, and it smells the same. And all that stuff floods back. And they pull this open. You know, and these were not things that Joseph regularly had in Egypt. These were things that were imported. And he, he, he smells all the smells. He sees the things. All this flot runs into him of him eating these things and having these things when he was a boy back in his homeland. He was not an Egyptian he was from Canaan. The smells, the taste, the best fruits. Egypt was forced on him. Forced on him because of the sin of his brothers. The foolishness, the hate of his brothers that were standing before him. He had been human trafficked against his will, torn away from the land that he loved, the land that God loved, the land that David would sing of, the, day, the land that prophets proclaimed over, the land that Jesus wept over. This was all stripped away from him when he was drugged away by force to Egypt. The hurt still stung in his heart. Finally, the loss of the relationship with his father. That hurt. You hear Joseph inquiring about Jacob from the very first moments, chapters when they first showed up. He's always asking. He's asking a lot. Is your father well? Is your father well? And this, you can... When right before they come at the beginning of this chapter, this is what they're telling their dad. He's asking about our father. He's asking about you. He was asking about you. You know, they don't know that it's Joseph. He's always asking this guy, this man is asking. Verse 27, is your father well? Is he alive? You remember this was the angst of his brothers all those years ago. He had a special relationship with his dad. He was the favorite, Joseph. And the coat of many colors proved it. His father adored him. And although, of course, we preached against favoritism, that part of his father's love was special to him. And all that was lost, and his hurt was deep. But the miracle here, folks, is that Joseph was God's child, and God's grace had crowded out all hints of bitterness out of Joseph's hearts to replace it his heart to replace it with mercy. And through this chapter, you can see Joseph repaying all the hurt that he was, that was poured upon him with kindness and mercy. And, and, and when we clear 44 and 45, you are going to see all kinds of kindness poured out on these brothers who had done him so wrong. See the kindness of him preparing the feast. See the kindness of him speaking peace to them through the steward about their money, the treasure in their bags. See the kindness of him giving them water, washing their feet, uh, feeding the animals for them. He asks about their welfare. Feel the kindness of him, him having this big grand party and this banquet and having him there. And as they're all, they all are making merry together. It's kindness. It's love. We're supposed to see this. We're supposed to see that he is giving these Enemies, these people who had treated him so wrong, he is being kind to them and merciful. There would be one more lesson in chapter 44 that God would use Joseph to teach them, but for now, the only thing coming out of Joseph's hurt is mercy and kindness. There's no doubt, as I've been preaching along, that in this assembly this morning, there are people who have been seriously hurt in your life by others. You know, that's, that is a fair assumption. And those like Joseph that have been falsely accused, perhaps, taken advantage of, abused, torn from opportunities, relationships, a life that should have been yours. And you're hurt. Like Joseph. Well, you have a few choices. You can, um, you can seethe in your, your hurt and, and let it develop thicken into bitterness, rolling over and over in your mind what someone has done to you, how they've been wrong, and holding on to that identity as a victim the rest of your life, losing faith that God is really in control even of that situation and taking you to his expected end. Perhaps you desire in that revenge and restitution. Or you can do something else. 
Instead, you can allow the grace of God to give you the power to forgive and show mercy and kindness to those who have hurt you. A true act, a true miracle act. Because us in our fallen nature and in our flesh, we don't want to do that. We never would want to do that. It is evident in this passage that God is handling and changing these brothers. And that takes faith to give that side of things totally to God. That God avenges and God chastens and you don't have to do that. That God will be faithful in that also. Let me first ask you in this choice of yours. Uh, if you even want to show mercy to your offenders. That's a, that's a very convicting thing to say to true children of God. Because it brings immediate shame. Because there's, none, there's no one in this, this auditorium with Jesus inside your heart that would say, no, I don't want to. You may not want to, but you would never say that out loud. So I'm going to ask you that to bring you to the point of shock. Do you even want to show mercy towards your offenders? Jesus himself was a great teacher of mercy. He said, turn the other cheek. He said, love your enemies. He said, feed your enemies if they hunger and thirst. Feed your enemies if they hunger and thirst. He said, if, if those who take advantage of you take away your coat, give them your shirt also. He said, do good to those who despitefully use you. See, Joseph, although... Many, many years before, Joseph is really living out the teachings of Jesus, the grace of God in his heart towards people who didn't deserve it. Jesus taught that. But, but in a greater way, folks, Jesus lived that, or I should say Jesus died that. He taught it, but he also died it. His death on the cross was for all of us who are born and continue to be the enemies of God because of our sin. Yes, I said that, including Toby. Yes, we were the offenders. We are the violators. We were the abusers, the rejecters of God because of every sin we have committed against Almighty God. Almighty God is holy, and he demands that we be holy. And the, the payment, the judgment of not being holy, of being in sin and offensive and violating God is eternal separation from God in a place called the lake of fire. It is real. And that truly is. I don't care how many scoffers, modernists, scoff at those things and atheists, it, is, it will certainly work its way out that, wa that way. We are not holy and God will hold us accountable for our sin. But, However, but God, who is rich in, what's the next word? Mercy. For his great love, wherewith he loved us, or because of his great love, even when we were dead in sins, that means dead to God, against God, hath made us alive, quickened us, spiritually made us alive in our relationship with God made us alive spiritually together with Christ by grace are you saved not not because you earn it not because you've been not you we are Joseph's brothers that's who we are and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. We, folks, are Joseph's brothers. Instead of the wrath that we should have received, God shows us mercy that would bring, that will bring immeasurable kindness forever and ever and ever through what Jesus did for us if we will accept that. God returned kindness for our hurt towards him. And I want to say to everyone here today, if you have not received God's kindness of Jesus' salvation towards you as a sinner, you need not wait. It's by grace. You, you, you don't qualify for it. There is no, you don't, you don't live up to it. You say, I'm a wretched sinner. Jesus saved me because you died for my sins. And he will save you. He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out, he said. Whosoever will may come, Jesus said. Call. And I will answer you, he said. 
call out today and ask him to be your savior and mercy and grace and compassion and love will flow down to you from the merciful God. You need only call once because you can only be saved once and he gives you eternal life. You need not ask again and again. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Admit and turn from living a life for sin. Admit that you are a sinner and accept God's mercy and grace and kindness. This is what is kind of being played out in the story. This is the gospel for your salvation. And it is the gospel for hurting and maybe bitter people that need to extend the same mercy that Jesus extended to you. He didn't only teach you to love your enemies. He showed you how to love your enemies by stretching out his hands and dying for you. Dying for his enemies, for those who hurt him. Even some of his last words on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Will you, person who has been maybe brutally hurt here, Will you return mercy, forgiveness, and kindness for the hurt? Would you bow your heads, please, this morning?